Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Beyond the Dais, a podcast about the stories taking place in and around El Paso County, Colorado. I'm your host, Scott Anderson, and today I am joined by Liz Denson, the president and CEO for Early Connections Learning Centers. How are you doing today, Liz? Great, great. It's been a wonderful day. Oh, yeah, it has been a wonderful day. It started to chill a little bit, which uh, eh, it's fine. It's that time of year. But I, for all of you who have not been over here to this building, it looks like something that you would see at Disneyland. It is a really cool looking building. Um, I think uh, when I was coming in here, someone was telling me it was built over 100 years ago. Yeah, yeah. This building was built for our organization um, in 1922. Oh my gosh, yeah. that is that's so cool. Okay, so we're going to get into more of that. Uh, but before we get started, I wanted to quickly add that if listeners are interested in more stories about people doing good in and around El Paso County, or hearing from county leadership about local government priorities and how they operate, you can find additional episodes of this podcast on your podcast platform of choice. But to get into things, Liz, I was wondering if you could share a bit of background about yourself and how you came to be associated with Early Connections Learning Centers. Yeah. First, thanks so much for coming and, and including us in this um, this podcast opportunity. My background, um, I'm from Texas originally and uh, got my degree in advertising and organizational management I'm from Texas Tech and moved to Colorado Springs in 2012 um, and kind of landed into uh early education or landed into nonprofit work, I should say. My career in Colorado Springs began working at the Gazette in marketing and managing the empty stocking fund. Um, and then it, it kind of moved from that into more marketing responsibilities. When I left the Gazette, um, I came to Early Connections as a marketing manager. Um, and then uh, my resume is a little bit interesting in that since moving to Colorado, it goes Gazette, Early Connections, Gazette, Early Connections. Nice. Because I left Early Connections as a marketing manager um, for some family reasons. And then when I went back to work again, my um, uh, contacts at the Gazette re reached out and said, hey, you know, we, we have this position, maybe you'd be interested. And once again, found myself at the Gazette, again, managing empty stocking fund. Um, and right around that time, the previous CEO of Early Connections reached out to me and uh said, you know, I, I've created this position as the vice president of community engagement. Are you interested in it? Um, and so then came to work for Early Connections now almost eight years ago as the VP of community engagement. And then um, last summer in June, our previous CEO, uh, Diane Price, who had worked here for 33 years as the CEO, retired. Mm -hmm. And I was really fortunate enough um, to, to be selected as her uh, successor into this role. So I've now been in this position about a year and a half as president and CEO. Awesome. Oh, yeah. that's incredible. And so like, this is a very unique opportunity for me, so I have to take it. I am also a Red Raider. Oh, nice. So super cool. Now, I did not graduate from there, but I spent time... Uh, up in Lubbock and uh, it was awesome. Yeah. I, yeah. Lo I loved Lubbock. I loved my time at Texas Tech. So uh, finding a fellow Red Raider is uh, pretty rare out here. So I, I, this is very exciting for and me. And what a small world because we didn't even like tee that up to talk about it. That, nope. was, that was awesome. No, nope, just very cool. Yeah. What great happenstance. All right. Moving on from that fun stuff. Uh, so can you share some background about Early Connections Learning Centers itself and what the main mission of the organization is? Well, I could talk about this all day. Early Connections Learning Centers um, was founded in 1897 in Colorado Springs by 14 women. Um, at that point, a lot of people had been moving and relocating west for tuberculosis cures and also to chase their dreams of finding gold. Mm -hmm. um, and so all of these families had moved into Colorado Springs area. Um, and the kind of the women of the day r recognized that there was no one to care for the children during the day. So men may have been working and potentially dying in the gold mines up in Cripple Creek in the area, um, or they were in sanitariums chasing their tuberculosis cures. And women were forced into the workforce as nurses, laundresses, maids, um, and no one to care for their children during the day. So these 14 women came together um, in, the, in the basement of a church in downtown Colorado Springs and wrote the bylaws for this organization in the same day. Uh, we were founded as the Colorado Springs Day Nursery Association. Um, and over time, uh, and they leased a property um, and began accepting children and caring for them. Um, over the next 20-ish years, we outgrew several locations. We rented some facilities. We owned a, a small home um, throughout Colorado Springs. And then one of the um, founding board members um, was Alice Bemis Taylor, 
who you may know from Colorado College with Bemis Hall, or um, La Ferre was her family summer home. Um, and Mrs. Taylor announced that she was going to build a permanent home for the Day Nursery Association, and that's the building we're sitting in today. Wow. Um, she felt strongly that had we had a facility like the Day Nursery, where we are right now, um, during the uh, Spanish influenza pandemic, then we would have lost much less children mm-hmm. to that disease. Yeah. Um, and that was really what she wrote in her letter to the board when she announced that this building would be built for us. So construction began in 1921. Um, and Children and matrons moved in in December of 1922, and it was completed in 1923. Um, The building is gorgeous Tudor-style mansion, three stories, full basement, full attic, and it was meant to be built for children. So I don't know if you've seen it yet, but if you go into any of the restrooms, the bathrooms, they're teeny tiny toilets, and the (laughs) sinks are really low. All of the door handles and stairwell or stair banisters are really low. The building was built and intended to serve children. Mm -hmm. People drive by all the time. Oh, this had to have been a church. It must have been a church, but it really was built for early, early education and, and to care for the, our community's children. Um, so over the years, um, as I mentioned, we were founded in 1897, 126 years ago. We've opened additional facilities. Um, the Day Nursery is definitely our corporate headquarters, and we have three classrooms, uh, three preschool classrooms in this building and two school-age classrooms. But we also have a facility behind the Antlers Hotel, um, uh, and that facility has been there since the 1950s. That was built by the Junior League in the 1950s, and our organizations merged in the 70s and 80s. Um, and then we also have a location out on uh, in southeast Colorado Springs off of Shelton Road um, in partnership with the Boys and Girls Club. And that facility was built in the 80s. So we have a really long and rich history of providing high-quality or comprehensive early education services to families. Um, And we pride ourselves in really serving the whole child. It's more than just um, preschool services, or it's more than just that early education component. We have a health and nutrition component. Um, We have a behavioral health component, which we'll talk a lot about today because that's specifically what the county funded for us during this funding opportunity. Um, But providing an opportunity for families to be successful, one thing about child care and early education is that it creates an opportunity for families to work or go to school. If nothing else, I think that's one of the things the pandemic taught us, that we have to have child care in order to have a functional, successful economy. Um, you know, you can have a Zoom meeting with a toddler climbing all over you for only so long before right. it's not working for everybody. Yeah. Um, and employers uh, as well, and, and the children as well. Children need a place to run and play, and, and while their fam- parents are on Zoom, it's really hard for them to be able to do that. Yeah. Um, But uh, I think what makes Early Connections really unique is that not only our long history of providing these supports to um, Colorado Springs residents, but the high quality nature, we're voluntarily accredited by a national accrediting body that less than 10% of childcare organizations in the country are accredited by, because we believe strongly that every child, regardless of their family's ability to, to pay, deserves access to the highest quality early education services. So the way that we operate is that we partner with state and federal subsidy programs like the Colorado Children, uh, Colorado Child Care Assistance Program, CCAP. We also partner with CPCD, our local Head Start grantee, to provide early Head Start and Head Start services, but on a full day, full year model, where Head Start is typically part day, part year, right. and maybe only four days a week, where five days a week open 6.30 to 6. Um, we really meet that need of a working family that... We know, you know, a lot of child care organizations may be open 8 to 5, maybe 7.30 to 4. Right. If you're working an 8 to 5 job, it's really challenging for you to, be able to make that work for your family, as right. you know, with, yeah. you, with your children. <laughs> yeah. um, so uh, we work hard to ensure that we're meeting the needs of our community, whether um, that be with state, sus- state subsidy, federal subsidy. And if you don't qualify for either of those programs, um, if you make too much money, quote unquote, according sure. to the federal government or the state government, mm-hmm. um, we utilize philanthropic dollars to subsidize further the um, cost of childcare. Childcare is really expensive. And even um, at a discounted rate, you're looking at a really significant portion of your income, especially for families with multiple children, mm-hmm. families of single parents. Um, it's really challenging. Some single parents are having to pay over 50% of their income on child care. And so we utilize philanthropic dollars, whether that be from foundations, individuals, special events, fundraising, to further subsidize the, the cost of high-quality child care. There's a lot there that I want to get into, but I wanted to start off. It has to be pretty unique to be part of an organization that dates back to the 1800s at this point. And 
I mean, it sounds like the like the basic tenets of the organization haven't changed in, right. in, in that amount of time. What, I guess, responsibility do you feel as president and CEO of the organization to maintain that same, you know, those same tenants, that, that same uh, mission that was started 120 some odd years ago into modern day, into today, and like then like into the future to make sure this stays around for another 120 years? Gosh, you're so right. The, and just the responsibility, um, I think, is huge. Um, I have an incredible amount of respect for the history of our organization. And I think that too is one of the undercurrents of our organization. We um, have a fairly robust archives room of all of the amazing documentation over the years. We have child's files um, all the way back into the 1910s, 1920s, which is also really special. Um, but I think managing that level of respect and, and understanding the the weight of it that we today in 2023 are responsible for protecting the history and the legacy of all of the individuals who have run this organization before us and have, have um, not only worked here, but also the families and the children who attended here. Mm -hmm. So many people have a really personal connection to this building, to the day nursery, yeah. and then also to early connections as a whole. Um, previous to being um, renamed in 2010 as Early Connections Learning Centers, we were the Colorado Springs Child Nursery Centers. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people um, who attended our, our services in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, um, they know us as the nursery centers. Yeah. And so I think recognizing the the level of responsibility that we have to preserve our history and then also thinking about how we do that today in 2023 that is something that keeps me up at night we <laughs> we um we just are moving we just finished it um a transition to cloud-based file storage right. allowing us the opportunity to save things in a different way other than just on-site prim premises servers mm -hmm. um which i think i'm getting into more detail than what you're asking about but um <laughs> We're working through that. How do we ensure? I mean, we have the bylaws that were handwritten in a leather bound journal on March 16th, 1897. We have that journal. That's so cool. How do, <laughs> how do I now save our board minutes to yeah. ensure that a hundred years from now, if people are wondering what was happening in 2023 with early connections, what did early connections do during the pandemic? Yeah. How can I illustrate that to someone a hundred years from now? So it's, um, it's a lot to, yeah. to, to manage and be respectful of, I think. Um, but I think one thing, too, that makes us so special because of the incredible legacy that we're building upon is that we have done such a great job as an organization over the last few generations to preserve our history and that it's become part of our nature, part of the, our culture, part of the way that we operate is ensuring that 100 years from now we can provide the services or provide the information yeah. about the services we are providing right now in 2023. Yeah. yeah that, that's so cool. And you know, something I never really think about myself, <laughs> but uh, it does seem like there is sort of like you kind of like you talked about that responsibility of like carrying on a legacy. Um, that, that's really fascinating. So you also mentioned that you've expanded, you know, uh, since the beginning, you mentioned uh, the center uh, behind Antlers Hotel it came in the 50s uh, in Southeast Colorado Springs, uh, that location that uh, you partnered with the Boys and Girls Club. So approximately at this point, how many people do you serve and what communities do you serve specifically? Yeah, we serve around 300 children every day. Um, the children that we serve are anywhere from six weeks old, um, and we're licensed all the way to serve children who are 16 years old. Um, we serve primarily low-income families, although you do not have to be low-income to attend Early Connections. About 60% of our families qualify for the state subsidy program through CCAP. Um, and then about 95 to 98% of our families either qualify for subsidy and utilize it or fall on our sliding fee scale. We have a very small percentage of families um, two to 5%, depending on the year, who enroll their children with us, who who pay the quote unquote full fee, pay our, our full tuition rate, um, our higher income families, um, because they want to have their children in a diverse atmosphere. They want to have their children in a really high quality early education program. Our accreditation by the national body I mentioned earlier, NACI, which is the National Association for the Education of Young Children, that is a huge stamp of approval on the level of high quality early education that we're providing here. And there are few locally accredited um, childcare organizations. So if you really want to invest in the early education that your child's receiving, going to a NACI accredited program is the way to do that. Yeah. So can you talk to me then about how important it is for 
the organization to be viewed as a place that the community can turn to in their time of need. You know, you talk about how you do serve a low income population, but you know, other people see the value that you bring and the quality of the education that their children can get here. What does it mean to, I mean, to, to essentially have that, I mean, that's not something that everybody has. It's not, you know, not just any organization can pop up and be trusted by the community in that way? Like how valuable is that to you and the organization to be seen in that way? You know, I I think that speaks back to um, this whole idea of protecting the legacy of our organization and respecting the legacy. Um, You're exactly right. Not a lot of organizations have the benefit of 126 years of community trust built into it, Um, which also adds a little bit more pressure to (laughs) to our current day. Yeah. Um, But uh, it's incredibly valuable from every perspective. As I mentioned, you know, we've had generations of Colorado Springs families walk through our doors. We've cared for generations of children. Um, and it's so amazing to me when someone comes and enrolls their child and they say, I went here and my grandmother went here or what, or whatever. Oh, that's They're, wild. It's amazing. <laughs> that's so wild. Yeah. It's so, it, and it's so special. Um, so to not only have the trust of families based upon their experiences from interacting with our teachers, interacting with our staff and enrolling with us, but also the interactions of donors over the last 126 years, we've always been an organization reliant upon community support in order for us to provide our services. So we are so fortunate to have this long history of incredible stewardship and incredible um, trust by our community that we are doing the best work that we can with the donors, with the, the dollars that are contributed to us, that we are ensuring that the services that we provide are the highest quality um, and that we're dedicated to continuing to do that. Um, I think that, you know, uh, the saying is people give money to the people that they like. Mm-hmm. We're really fortunate. We have a lot of people who like us. That, that <laughs> there's a lot of people who trust us. Yeah. And that's something that um, we don't take lightly mm-hmm. and that we want to continue to preserve um, for the 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 president and CEO and the fundraising team 50 years from now, 100 yeah. years from now, that we, we are a place that an organization that the community feels confident in what we're doing, the services we're providing, and that when they make a donation to Early Connections Learning Centers, you know exactly where your where your money's going and what it's going to support. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, speaking of speaking of the, that money and how it works, after submitting your grant request to the county, Early Connections Learning Centers was awarded seventy thousand dollars of ARPA specific funding. Uh, can you talk about what that money has gone to fund? Yeah. You know, we received that grant in early twenty twenty two, and um, the opportunity to apply for that funding came in twenty twenty one kind of height of COVID. Um, Mm -hmm. And by height of COVID, I don't necessarily mean the pandemic shutdowns. I mean more of maybe the aftermath is maybe a best way to to put that, that we are coming out of the shutdown, which early connections kept our doors open every day during the pandemic, short of the days we were required to close because of some sort of outbreak. Mm -hmm. But we were really priding ourselves on staying open to serve our families because they were having to go to work. They needed us to be here. Um, So that's kind of a little rabbit trail aside. But... (laughs) Uh, this funding in particular, at that time when we made our application to the county, we were seeing a lot of children um, enrolling with challenging behaviors. And this is something that we've been seeing over the last eight to 10 years. Um, About 10 years ago, our board um, recognized this increase in children enrolling in challenging behaviors. And the converse of that was then we were also having a significant number of teachers leaving early connections and maybe even the early education field because they weren't equipped with the tools they needed and trained appropriately in order to be able to manage their classroom um, and be able to address some of these um, behaviors that we were seeing. So at that time, um, our board elected to bring on a behavioral health specialist onto our staff to work with our teachers um, and work with them really intentionally, not only providing direct support to children, but also providing that training and, and professional development to our teaching staff. And then our board elected to, uh, the board chair at that time was Robert Gonzalez, and he will get a kick out of me mentioning him on this podcast, number one. <laughs> but also um, he said, well, why don't we put Pyramid on steroids? Pyramid is the framework that we utilized as, as an organization. Um it's a, a, a compilation of strategies um, and redirection techniques um, grounded in positive interve- or positive reaction or uh, positive um, interactions. Um, when a child is having 
uh, for lack of a better word, meltdown or, or, or you know, yeah. just really struggling. Yeah. Oh, then, I've seen those. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then utilizing some of these strategies and techniques to help redirect that child um, to address their feelings, absolutely, but also to help them move forward in a positive direction. So the system we were using um, was known as Pyramid Plus at the time. And our board chair, um, Robert, said, well, why don't we put Pyramid on steroids? Let's invest in our behavioral health team. And that meant really intentionally um, not just introducing our teachers to the, the strategies of Pyramid, but deep dive training, bringing um, and training coaches that, that were also on our staff, trainers to be on our staff. Um, every teacher that worked in our organization was trained and coached um, at various levels in these pyramid strategies, which we absolutely reaped the benefits of. We we are an organization that doesn't turn children away, um, and we often find ourselves being a last stop of families coming to us saying, you know, and sometimes they don't say, but that um, they've been turned away from other child care organizations because the teachers didn't feel equipped to handle the, the special right. needs of that child. And yeah. so we pride ourselves in not turning children away and, and helping to address the, the needs of that individual child and family. All of that to say, when we applied um, for the grant um, from El Paso County at that time, we had one behavioral health director and one behavioral health specialist. So we had two. So over the course of 10 years, our behavioral health program had grown a little bit. But we were finding they were completely overwhelmed yeah. and unable to meet the needs of the child, children who were, maybe they weren't with early connections, they were with a child care organization that had shut down, or maybe they're school-aged children who were having to navigate virtual learning, um, having to navigate reading people's emotions behind masks, mm -hmm. having to learn how to speak without being able to see their teacher's mouths move, um, all of those things. And, and when you can't communicate, it's really frustrating. So... Um, we applied to the county to fund an additional behavioral health interventionist to join our staff with the commitment from our board that once this funding ended from El Paso County, that we would continue to make that a budget line item, that we would not build this team up just to bring it back down once right. the funding ended. Right. Um, and so that's where we utilized that $70,000 was bringing on that additional behavioral health interventionist, shoring up the needs of our behavioral health team in order to be able to provide these services, necessary services to the children and families enrolled with us. Um, and we still have that behavioral health interventionist on staff. We still have that position, um, which has been huge for us to be able to increase from one behavioral health contracted specialist 10 years ago to now today where we have three behavioral health individuals on staff. Mm -hmm. Oh, that, that's incredible. Uh, so how has working with other organizations in the area benefited the programs that you're working on. I know you've mentioned a couple as we've been talking, Boys and Cl Girls Club specifically has stuck out to me, but uh, how has working with them benefited uh, the work that you guys do? I think one of the key components of the way that Early Connections operates is that we want to partner with the people who have the expertise that we don't or who have the opportunity to access things that we aren't able to access. We currently partner with CPCD, who is our um, uh, local Head Start grantee to provide, as I mentioned, early Head Start and Head Start services on a full day, full year model to provide the needs for working families. Um, we're open 630 to 6, so we're, we're providing 11 and a half hours 11 half hours a day of care to children. And if you are a family, maybe you commute up to Denver, maybe you need to drop your child off at 630 so you can make it to work on time. Yeah. And, you know, as from my own personal experience, it was really challenging trying to get my daughter picking her up at 530 on the dot with my family child care home that I utilized when she was really young mm -hmm. closed. It was closing down the office right at five and heading across town to go pick her up. Yeah. Um, so we, we work to meet those needs of those families. But our partnership with CPCD has been key and is 23 years um, old at this point. We also partner, um, I mentioned Boys and Girls Club, and that's been kind of a facilities partnership. We partnered back in the 80s to build the building on South Shelton. They own one half and we own one half. Um, we also uh, provide universal preschool services, um, which is that UPK state of Colorado benefit to all children in the year before they enter kindergarten. Um, so that's been a significant partnership for us as well to provide those services. Um, and then with relation to our behavioral health work, we partner um, to um, refer families out to whether they need speech pathology, speech therapy, um, physical therapy, occupational therapy. We are not in the business of having those people on our staff to provide those services. So let us partner with people who are experts in that work to bring them in to help support the children, the families, and then our teachers and the needs of those families um, and those children. 
And then also I'll mention we, um, in addition to our, the care that we provide within our centers, we also partner with individually licensed family child care homes. So Early Connections, our mission is that we provide access to uh, comprehensive, high-quality early education for all children, whether or not that isn't within Early Connections walls. We, um, 23 years ago, um, launched the home network of the Pikes Peak region with the intention of working intentionally with these individual business owners. They own their own business within their home. They're a family child care home, child care provider, to increase their quality, um, to work with them with business sustainability practices. A lot of these individuals get into family child care not because they are incredible business savvy into people, but because they want to care for children. And right. they probably, maybe they started because they wanted to stay home caring for their own children. They adopted or brought in some of the neighborhood kids over the, over the, um, the years. And now they find themselves with the family child care home business, but maybe don't have the business sustainability practices in place to help them um, be successful. Right. So we currently are partnering with 16 family child care homes around El Paso County to um, do just that, to help them, um, provide for their own business sustainability to provide higher quality services within their home. And then um, ultimately just help them be successful and, and allow for greater access to high quality early education, whether it's in a center like early connections or if it's in family child care home. Yeah, that's, fa- that's fascinating. Um, really, really interesting. And not something, and something uh, as someone, again, coming from the outside, wouldn't even think that that's, that's something that's provided. So that's really cool. Another key partner in our organization is Court Care of the Pikes Peak Region. If you're not familiar, Court Care operates within the El Paso County Courthouse and offers free drop-in child care to anyone with court-related business. And that doesn't mean if you're just there because you may have some challenges in the legal system. Um, also, if you're a juror and you have a child and you need to op- um, access child care facility, mm-hmm. um, they can provide that service. But it's a free drop-in service. They have their own board of directors, but they contract with Early Connections to provide the services within that program um, because they also believe in the high quality nature of the services that we provide. Yeah. Oh, no, that, that's incredible. So I was wondering if there is a personal story that you can share uh, to help demonstrate the work that the organization does. Yeah, I kind of have two. One is incredibly personal and the other is more um, general. Um, I'll start with the incredibly personal. My um, daughter is two and a half. And when we were pregnant, trying to find infant care was incredibly challenging in El Paso County. Um, and I kind of have connections in the industry, right? I mean, <laughs> right, right. Um, she's two and a half now, so this is only three years ago. Um, and I happened to be the first person to comment on a Facebook post that someone had an opening in their home for an infant. I happened to be the first person that go to tour that home. And thank goodness she was a high quality home. And I absolutely treasure my time having my daughter there. Mm-hmm. Um, but um, for the first year and a half, she was at a family child care home, which was 30 minutes away from my work and an hour away from my home. Yeah. So the commute was terrible. Yeah. Um, within Early Connections at that time, we didn't have availability for her to be in one of our infant classrooms. So she couldn't come here to Early Connections until yeah. she was 18 <laughs> months old. So for a year and a half, I had a, a an awful, terrible commute just taking her to a family child care home, which ended up being a wonderful experience except for all the time lost right. driving in the car. Right. Um, and now she's at Early Connections at one of our classrooms in the Antlers facility and just thriving. She's It's unbelievable how well she speaks and everything that she's accomplished and everything she's exploring and doing, which I just love. Um, but the story that I think is more general, and some of your listeners may remember, um, a few years ago, pre-COVID, um, the story of the family child care home that had a false wall with children in their basements. Um, this woman was operating a child care facility um, and she was caring for more children than she was supposed to be through per licensing. She had a false wall in her home and there were children found in the basement by police. Um, and this was a really big story, a national story, huge um, uh, ordeal for these families and absolutely devastating ordeal for these families. There was a lot of trust that was lost in the child care industry by these individuals, understandably so. Yeah. Um, And the reason I bring up that particular story is because it was fairly close to downtown and in an afternoon, 50 families found themselves without having childcare. Um, 
I use that term 50 loosely. I don't exactly know how many families right. it was, right. but a significant number of families found themselves without childcare. And many of them, our phone just started ringing off the hook. I think our phone actually started ringing before the story broke because people were new that they, they have to go to work tomorrow. They yeah. have, they have to find some, a place for their child. Um, and we enrolled a significant number of those families within our two downtown centers. And it was heartbreaking to talk with these families. Um, uh, families who felt like they had made a bad decision or they should have known better. Right. Um, and that's certainly not fair to them. And we spent a lot of time working with those family, with the, the, the moms crying on our shoulders in the hallways of how could I let this happen to me type conversation. Right. Um, and it's been incredible to now look back at that horrible, devastating situation. And then two of those parents who enrolled with us at that time now sit on our board um, a handful of other parents are still enrolled with us. Many of them have become donors to our organization. The reason I think that's such an impactful story is because it was an awful situation, but Early Connections was here and available and able to help provide these children and these families with the services that they needed um, on a lot of different levels, not just, yes, we can take care of your child for 11 and a half hours a day, but let us also coach you through and walk you through that you didn't make any, this is not your fault and right. that we're here to support you and that ultimately we're going to continue to be here to support you and other families for generations to come. I, uh, you know, I, I try and put myself in the shoes of people that have that experience. It really, I, I, I can't imagine with that type of thing. How do you help rebuild that trust? I, I'm sure, you know, it's not something that happens overnight. It's not something that happens over the course of a week, Right. But when parents trust you to take care of their most prized possessions, right? Their, their children, how do you, how do you rebuild that trust with them? And how do you let them, let them know that, you know, it's okay to be experiencing those feelings. It's okay to, you know, of course, in this situation, be a little bit distrustful of, of the scenario and, you know, having to, again, give your kids to someone that you don't really know. I mean, how do you do that? And, and how do you make them feel okay with it again? I think it's a lot of empathy. I think it's a lot of, um, willingness to have some harder conversations with, in this instance, parents that we had just met, uh, Mm -hmm, you know, who are distraught over what had happened to them. Um, reassuring them that uh, I'll, I'll say that there we have a, a few things going for us that help build that trust that we are NACI accredited that we have these inter, um, these federal type partnerships there's a lot of oversight within our organization that may or may not have been happening within that particular situation mm-hmm. um, but we worked intentionally with our teachers um, who were welcoming those children into the classrooms we our behavioral health team was heavily involved um, in making those transitions Um our directors also one unique thing about early connections is that we operate in a, what's called a shared services model. So all of our corporate type functions are in one place. And what I mean by that is a director isn't responsible for collecting enrollment fees or tuition payments or a director is responsible for um, enrolling families. So that leaves the director, the opportunity to build a really deep intentional relationship with the family, completely unrelated to the business aspect of a childcare facility, yeah. which is unique Typically, it doesn't operate in that way. I think because of the way that we operate, um, but also because of the nature of the people who work for our organization, they too are working for our organization because they believe in our mission. They believe in caring for children. They believe that um, every child deserves access to high quality services. And because of who we have working for us, building that trust um, wasn't a gigantic leap for them to trust the staff that were then caring for their children compared to their previous experience. Yeah. But I mean, you're totally right. It's, it's hard. I (laughs) drop you know, too, dropping your children off with someone or having someone else care for even a babysitter overnight. That can be scary. I haven't even gotten into that territory. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, I can appreciate, I can appreciate the difficulty there. Um, So are there any other programs that the organization offers that you feel would be important for listeners to know about? I feel like I've kind of touched on them throughout the whole conversation. Um, Court Care is obviously a a great partner of ours, um, as well as our our work with the Home Network of the Pikes Peak region. We as an organization 
tend, well, we're fortunate as an organization to have the opportunity to have our um, staff at whatever level give them the opportunity to participate at local and regional and state um, industry level type conversations, helping provide for the direction of the industry of early childhood in Colorado. We've been heavily involved in the UPK rollout from the very beginning, um, even from the days of Proposition EE being passed. Um, We work to ensure that our voice is at the table when decisions are being made at the local, regional, or state levels, and sometimes at the national levels, related to early education and what the needs of our industry are and what the needs of children and families are. The... um, we're fortunate that we have that opportunity to dive deeper and and create even more lasting change um, and improvements in the early childhood industry. So for those who may be seeking services, uh, how can they go about obtaining those services? We have spots um, currently available to enroll with Early Connections. Visit our website. It's earlyconnections.org. Um, Or you can also give us a call at 719-632-1754 and speak with our enrollment team. Um, We are also um, entering into, you know, the season of giving with the the end of the year approaching. And there are ways, if you aren't just interested in enrolling with Early Connections, there are a lot of ways you can become involved with Early Connections. Um, We are always looking for volunteers. We welcome volunteers who have a special talent or... um, ability to come in and demonstrate that talent or ability with our classrooms, whether it's playing a trumpet or doing magic or, you know, (laughs) or even just coming in and reading a book. Um, You know, our children love having visitors in the classroom and it's a great um, grounding reminder of what is really important in in our community and investing in the the earliest, the youngest members of our community is a great way to to be reminded of that. Um, so enrollment, volunteering information is on our website. And then if you're interested in making a gift to Early Connections, um, information for that is also on our website. Very good. Well, when someone comes in to do magic, you let me know because okay. I love magic. Yeah. It's very cool. Um, so we've, we've, I feel like we've been able to cover a lot of ground here, but I do want to give you an opportunity uh, to add anything else that you think would be important for listeners to know. I think one of the most important things for individuals, organizations who aren't in the early childhood industry to realize is that childcare is a critical infrastructure to a successful economy. Without childcare, parents cannot work or go to school. Um, By having the opportunity to have your child in a high quality early education program like Early Connections, it provides the family the opportunity to break some of those cycles of poverty. They're allowed to go to work. They are able to go to school without wondering if their child is in a safe and cared for place. Um, employers are able to rely on the, the early childhood industry. That that basic necessity to support a working parent exists in our community. I One unique thing I think that came out of the pandemic was that, was that we realize as a country how critical child care is as an infrastructure piece. But I think it's also more than that. Um, Not only is it critical infrastructure for our economic stability, but looking generations down the line, um, we know the return on investment of, you know, for every dollar invested in early education, you have a $12 to $13 return in all of these savings in the future. Um, That, and we also know that a high quality early education experience increases the the rate of a high school graduation, college graduation, reduces prison population, reduces um, long-term negative health outcomes. Mm -hmm. Having that early education experience is so critical for setting children up for success in school and in life, but then also setting up the community for success. You and I aren't going to be here in 100 years, but our children might, and they are the ones that we need to be investing in to lead our community moving forward. Right. No, that's really good. Well, uh, thank you, Liz, for taking the time today. I appreciate it and for all the work that you do here at Early Connections Learning Center. So thanks for having me. Thank you so much for coming by, Scott. It's been great talking with you. If you're interested in listening to additional episodes of Beyond the Dais, be sure to look for us on Podbean or wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. 